contains a thing about remediation. So I'm going to pass it out to you again. So there's more yellow on there. Okay, so the one that I gave you last week is false or whatever. Okay, so there's that. So that's the, the competency standards. <clears throat> and then I'm, I don't think I gave you this last week, honestly. So I'm giving it to you now. It's the, the testing policy. Because, you know, when one policy changes, every, it affects other things. So the testing policy is not... The only thing that's different on it is I put a little blurb about the math test, about the process of the math test. Okay? Does that make sense? So everybody take one of those and then you can toss the other. And I just like you to have the latest copies of it so if anything ever comes out of it, then you know, I can say, well, I gave it to you. Right? All right, so that's that. I thought STEM went really well. I thought y'all did a great job. I haven't heard. I doubt it if you saw the cosmetology set up. <laughs> what were we going to win anyway? I didn't know we were having a contest. Well, they do a school thing, but it's okay. Y'all have y'all had to do it. Though. Y'all had no choice. Um, how did y'all feel about the school groups on Friday? They, you know, last year we had middle school and they were out of control. It was like a herd of elephants running around through here, and so they banned the they banned the middle school coming this year. So that's why they did high school. Right? Yeah, I thought they were fairly well behaved. Honestly, they were really good. Yeah. I thought everybody did a great job. So, um, if you've got if you've got extras, if you want, I saw a lot of people left candy in here. That's fine. There's going to be candy. The little stress gloves are back there, so if anybody wants to pass those out, those are good. Um, you may, those people who are going to help me out with that blood pressure uh, thing, the health fair, if you want to take any of that kind of stuff that day, you can. I'll do, I'll do still cover the place. Okay, so um, that might be something to take, good to take for those people who need to cover. All right, what... Other housekeeping do we have? Anybody? Anything burning in your gut that you just have to? Do you know when we're doing remediation with Miss? Or I mean, just said tomorrow. Tomorrow. I think she said tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, I made her go back and look at it again. So hopefully she'll. I don't know. Did she change anything? I don't know. Okay. Um, we'll see. Do you know what the fun average was on that? She started with three. No way. Three. No way. No way. So she'll get back to look at that, and then we'll we'll look at it again. Okay. Um. So so. Everybody take a chance to look at it tomorrow. And again, if you have any questions, then ask her. I mean, that's the only way you can get that done, right? The thing about remediation is we used to require it, and now we're strongly recommending it. <laughs> remediation. That's the thing. Well, and it, honestly, because it, the reason that we did that is because it's very difficult to get for everybody to do the same type of high-quality remediation, 
and we weren't getting what we thought we should get. So, but we really do recommend you doing remediation, right? Well, it, okay, so here's my thought process on this. Okay, so a 79 point, anything goes five, um, rounds up to 80, right? So technically, in your mind, you can say, oh, I made an 80. But I would think that it would be, you would be a very good student if you would just go ahead and do it, even if it's for yourself, right? And even if you pass a test and you know, sometimes you just pass a test and you look at your grade and you're like, wow, I didn't think I did that good. And it was just like you just kind of guessed at something and you mismanaged somehow to make it good. Then, you know, still do it because that reinforces it, right? That's con that constant reinforcement. Um, speaking of remediation, one thing that is required, though, is remediation of path lines. Okay, so I want to keep bringing that up again. Um, you know, Kaplan has lots of focused review tests, and they are great little review tools for you for these kind of tests. And when next fall comes, we're going to really be pushing you hard to do those remediation. And the other remediation with Kaplan is every question that you miss, you have to go back and review. Have you thought about how you're going to set your Kaplan up? Like, have, remember I talked about that? whether you do notebooks or whether you do <coughs> note cards or remember me talking about that? Some of you are like, what's happening? Um, okay, so y'all remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't thought about it, you really need to think about it. It's very, very important that you get started now because you do not want to be waiting till the last minute because you're going to have a lot of stuff to do. Okay. <coughs> You can do it a couple of different ways. You can either, that's what I was telling you, right? You can either type it up. A lot of people like to type notes. If you want to type, take the question that you missed, look at the topic, and then what was it about that topic that you didn't get? Like, you may be really good at, I don't know, give me, give me something here. Uh, Wound assessment. <coughs> assessment. You're really good at assessment, but you, you're lacking on the medications. You just missed something on the medication. So you need to really focus. You see what I'm saying? So focus on the areas that you feel really weak in and either type it, write it, do whatever. Hi, even if you highlight, remember, I don't, I'm not a real big highlighter person because remember me saying back in readiness that you can highlight yourself into a frenzy and it glows like the sun, and it's beautiful, all colored, but you really didn't re absorb anything, right? So, however you feel like you learn best is how you need to. Um, they don't give you the questions right. that you got wrong. Right, they don't. So, it's just a general, general topic. topic. General topic. When I read you have like 10 general topics of the same thing. You do. But think about what you do is you take that topic, and then I would go back to that basic book. Okay, your basic book. Everybody's got your basic book. Go back to that basic book. Find that topic and look at that outline that it gives you and see what it what is it in that outline that you just are not great at. You're not clear on. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So we need to make that up. Okay. So you need to get with. Um, well, just tell me one day after class. I'll So, does everybody understand? Now, when you get to be in the fall, what we will say is any of these integrated tests, or a lot of these integrated tests that you take here, there are multiple versions of. So, we can set you up to take another one if you want to, just for your own practice. We can say, you know, if you didn't really do good on the assessment, we'll say, okay, you know what, there's another version. Why don't you stay one day after class and just take it to see if you can do better for your own benefit, right? Okay? Those are great opportunities. You can do that any time, so just let me know. So the test that you've already taken, if you want to come back and do another version, they're not going to count against you or anything. It's just for your own benefit because the more questions you take, the better off you're going to be, right? Okay. Anybody, everybody clear on that? All right. So 
we are going to talk about, I'm glad you're back in the classroom. Yeah, this is one of the things I miss the most is being in the classroom. So I'm glad to be back with you guys. And we're going to talk about birth in the family. So that was one of the advantages when we were planning on who was going to teach what. I said, well, if there's any advantage to being the director, it's that I get to teach what I'm going to teach. So, um, so I wanted to keep at least one of my units from OD. So we are going to talk about birth in the family. I do a lot of, of props, too. So by the end of this unit, we are actually going to deliver a baby. I'm going to sit up here on the stretcher, and we're going to push it out, and we're all going to have excitement about it. So, um, so we'll have that. So uh, that's what all this is. So I have this stretcher in here for this, this whole unit. So I know it's kind of gangly, but we're just going to keep on going, right? All right, so what I want us to do first is let's let's talk a little bit about what you've learned so far about pregnancy to lead us in from this last unit. What what's really stuck out at you about antepartum? Because I wasn't in here with you and Okay, so, so fetal circulation. So, did everybody understand the biggest thing that I, I think you need to take from that is the different holes that close, right? Because those, those become very important. Um, in fact, I had a child two weekends ago that had an open hole, an open shunt. Murmur was very loud, very loud. So you talked about that, right? You talked about how they're supposed to close and when they're supposed to close. Everybody said that. What else did you learn? The four different hormones related to pregnancy. Okay, the hormones that were related to pregnancy. And we're going to bring a couple of those hormones back up again from labor. What were those four hormones? Do you remember? HCS, HCS, estrogen, and progesterone. We're going to talk about a couple of those in relation to labor, too. Okay. What else? Preterm labor. Preterm labor. Okay, preterm labor. And how do you know it's preterm labor versus real labor, right? Uh -huh. Did y'all talk about that? Yes. What kind of, what's the difference? The mis uh, cervix opening. Hmm? The opening. Okay, the cervix <laughs> changes. <coughs> Contractions. Possible lack of pain. Did you say that again? Your labor starts in the back. Okay. Contractions aren't always felt. Okay, contractions are always felt. Right. They're irregular. They're irregular. Okay. All right. Can you stop preterm labor? Yes. Yes. Hopefully, right? Our goal is to stop it because we want that baby to cook as long as possible. <laughs> And there are medications that help to stop that. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Okay, good. All right. What else did you talk about? Braxton Hicks. Okay. okay, Braxton Hicks. Contractions. Where are Braxton Hicks contractions? Well, they get you ready. Okay, they get you ready. They're, kind of, they're false contractions, right? They're not the real the real shebang. What is it doing? What is it? What are those contractions doing? They're preparing the the uterus, right? They're preparing the uterus to get ready. Okay. What else did you talk about? Pregnancy induced hypertension. Oh, P I H. Let's talk about P I H real quick, and then we're gonna. So, I always enjoy talking about P I H because I really want you to know the differences between not just PIH, but preeclampsia and eclampsia. Did you, did you understand the differences between PIH, preeclampsia, right, and then eclampsia. Now, what signals that we are eclamptic seizure activity? So what is the biggest safety thing that you need to make sure you have for those patients? Section. Seizure precautions, right? You always have seizure precautions. 
So if you've got a, a patient who comes in who is severely preeclamptic, you're going to already be ready. We don't want to be behind the eight ball whenever that patient starts to have a seizure, right? The PIH, so that's very, that, that's a big topic, okay? And what, what is one of the biggest things about that? What is, what is it causing? What is our biggest danger? <laughs> Decreased what? Decreased perfusion. Decreased perfusion. That's our biggest thing we need to keep in our mind with PIH. So decreased perfusion to, remember that the, the perfusion to the maternal and fetal organs is depressed. And that's a bad thing, right? The baby's not getting what it needs, right? All right, Julie, what did you say, Mary? Different tests. Okay, all those antipartum prenatal tests that y'all talked about. Prenatal testing. What other complications did you talk about? Health. Okay. And remember, health is, is it related to anything or can it be standalone? It's related to something. Related. Maybe they can be standalone. Health is a lab diagnosis. It is not a clinical diagnosis. Because what does it stand for? Hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Right? It is a lab diagnosis. Patients can have health without having anything else wrong. And that's something very important to remember. A lot of people think that health goes along hand in hand with hypertension, but it doesn't. It can, it can but it's not necessarily true for every case. So it can stand along. Right? What other complications did you talk about? Molar. Okay, congestive heart failure, the heart failure is kind of going along with the blood pressure problem. Molar pregnancies, did y'all talk about that? Yes. A great picture. There are some really good pictures on um, YouTube or um, like the images, the Google images for molar pregnancy. What's one of the biggest things for teaching things with molar pregnancy that you've got to make sure that you tell the person? It's not a baby. Well, that, but it can become cancer, right? Can't, the risk of cancer is very high, right? But what is it? Do not get pregnant for one year. They cannot, absolutely, that is, that is extremely important. That they cannot get pregnant for one year. What's the reason? Because of the risk of cancer. And so, what they're doing is during that year, they are drawing frequent HCG levels to make sure that the levels are going down, that they're not getting pregnant because of the risk of cancer. That is a very, very important thing to remember with molar pregnancies that they cannot get pregnant for a year. So like the hormones that could help the baby grow will help the cancer grow. Exactly. Exactly. Very important. Very important to remember. Big teaching thing. Okay. We talked a lot about the placenta and the umbilical cord and the function of the placenta. Okay. The purpose of the organs, the placenta and the umbilical cord. I'm just gonna put growth and development on that. Don't learn about diabetes. Gestational diabetes. Briefly. Pre-screening. All right. Okay. So now what I want us to do is I've got 
two more papers. And I want us to talk about, before we get started, what you, what you think you know about labor. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Put this one up here so we'll keep our skeleton. You have 24 hours from water break to get the baby out. Stop water break. 24 hours. Different birth plans. Vaginal versus cesarean. <laughs> positions <laughs> for birth. Birthing positions. <laughs> Fetal Uh, assistive devices like the vacuum and forceps. Grandmother's supplies. 
or grandmother's uh, leftovers of. And it was a little book that was given to her grandmother when she was pregnant with her child back in the 40s. And they would give them these little books. And they are the funniest things, little anecdotes. So I pulled out some of the little anecdotes about labor and stuff. And I printed them off because some of them are really long. So I want you to be able to go home and tell people about these because I've got them up on my slides, but you're going to forget when you get them off. So I printed them off because we're going to look at the first one right now about the hospital. Okay, so I'll read this to you. This is what the, the book says. That women who have had one baby at home and another in the hospital almost always affirm that hospital delivery is more comfortable, more restful, and as a rule, only slightly more expensive. Only <laughs> slightly. <laughs> the bother and expense of preparing the rather complicated paraphernalia necessary for home confinement are avoided. Look at this. The salary and board of a nurse are spared. So they would have to take a nurse and keep her in their house. They would have to board her for the confinement and pay her a salary. And as well as considerable outlay for laundry. Furthermore, a period of complete rest is assured without responsibility in the but most as important of all is the safety offered by hospitals in the event any slight complication develops. Their laboratory facilities, their special apparatus, to say nothing of their greatest pillar of security, the staff of nurses and doctors, make modern hospitals the very safest place in the world to have a baby. Doesn't that make you feel good? That was back in 1940. <laughs> so, We'll look at the rest of them in just a minute. I want to start talking about what we're going to talk about. But just imagine that back then, they would send these people to the hospital, and it was a new, it was something new. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was expected. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk. It's a wonderful little thing that they talk about in this book about how wonderful it is. But it's called Twilight Sleep. You go to sleep, you wake up, there's your baby. It's wonderful. It is. It's just great. So let's talk about the five keys in your book addresses these. Now, does everybody realize in your book? Hopefully, you've opened your book. Hopefully, you've gotten the plastic off your book. Um, in your book, this chapter is the labor chapter, the birth chapter, and we're going to talk about the medication the pharmac pharmacology chapter as well. So you've got a couple of different ones. All right, so we're going to talk about the five P's of labor, five things affecting labor. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the passage way. Passage way. So what is the passage way? The pelvis. This is our passage, right? So did you see this in the in like the unit? Did you pass this around and around? Okay. So this is the pelvis. There are there is a true pelvis and a false pelvis. Okay? So it's separated into two parts. The false part is above the brim, so it's up here where the baby is floating. Okay? The true pelvis is inside the pelvis, inside the bony parts of the pelvis. The coccyx, you remember this from anatomy, the coccyx down here, our, our tailbone, right, becomes movable later on in pregnancy. Becomes movable later on in pregnancy. So there are four types of pelvis, four types of pelvis. The first type of pelvis is the gynecoid. Gyne what does G-Y-N remind you of? Gyne. Female. The gynecologist, does that bring you back? Good, good memory for everybody that day? So gyne means female. So the gynecoid pelvis is the most 
common type of pelvis. 50% of us have a gynecoid pelvis. That is a female-shaped pelvis. Okay? The second type of pelvis is an android pelvis. It is a male-shaped pelvis. And it is, so some females have an android-shaped pelvis. Android pelvises are not favorable for vaginal delivery. When do they discover what shape of your pelvis you have? When do they do that, though? Prenatal. Prenatal. Prenatal appointment, okay? So did y'all talk about that? That's one of the things that they do is they measure the planes of your pelvis. So they're going to know whether or not you have a pelvis that's adequate for delivery before you get there. Okay? So an android pelvis is a male-shaped pelvis. It is not favorable for vaginal delivery. Everybody got that? And the reason for that is because, bless you, it has narrow, and I'm just going to kind of squeeze this a little bit, a, it has narrow planes. So on the inside, in the true pelvis part, it's very narrow. So a baby cannot fit through that. Okay? If a patient has an android pelvis and they attempt to push through an android pelvis, the baby will turn into the wrong position and they will get stuck. The baby will get stuck. So that is one reason, and we're going to talk about many, many reasons, but that is one reason it is vitally important for people to get prenatal care, right? Because if you don't get prenatal care, you don't know what shape pelvis you have, right? Okay. Anthropoid, anthropoid pelvis is an eight-shaped pelvis. What? Eight-shaped pelvis. Eight, A-P-E-shaped pelvis. It is okay for vaginal birth. It is, it is definitely a different uh, shape than a gynecoid pelvis, but the only big, the biggest difference is just that it's longer. So the pelvic planes are just longer. So it may take a little longer for you to push the baby through the, the canal, but it, it, the shape of it is still okay for you to vaginally deliver. So, so far we only have two, right, that we can vaginally deliver, gynecoid and anthropoid. The last type is platypoid. What does that sound like? A platypus. And what is, what is significant about a platypus? That flat tail. So, what does that tell us? That a platypoid pelvis is a flat pelvis. So it's very, you know, I told you that android pelvises are very narrow. They're still circular in shape. They're just very narrow. A platypoid pelvis is a flattened pelvis. The, the outlet is flat, okay? So it is very flat. So do you think that you could deliver a baby through that? No. So of the four types, there's only two types that we can deliver that baby through. A gynecoid pelvis and an anthropoid pelvis. Mixed types are the most common. So it is not uncommon. Remember, I only said that 50% of us have a gynecoid pelvis. That leaves room for over the 50%, right? Mixed types are more common. So you may have a gynecoid <coughs> slash anthropoid pelvis where it's the right shape, but it's just longer. Okay, so the gynecoid shape is just Now, in the third trimester of pregnancy, there is a hormone that is released. Do you remember what it, what it is? It starts with an R. Relaxin. Relaxin is secreted. And what happens to the joints and the ligaments? Relax. They relax. Whoever came up with the name for that hormone was very smart, right, because it helps us remember. So the pelvic joints and the tendons, they relax. And so what does that help this pelvis to do? Stretch, right? Because remember, we've got to get a baby with a big old noggin.
we've got to get this head through this pelvis. Okay. So but we've got to get a big head through this pelvis. And so we've got to be able to stretch and widen for that baby to maneuver and get its way through. So relaxing is a very, very important hormone. Okay. What do women complain about when that pelvis is stretching and moving? And what do they say? It hurts. It hurts. When your pelvis, when those joints and ligaments are stretching and moving so that baby can get through, it, there is some pain. It is uncomfortable. Okay, so that's the first piece, the passage way is the first piece. The second one is the passenger. So who's the passenger? The baby. The baby is the passenger. So the first thing that we need to know about the passenger is his noggin, his head. Okay. Do you remember from anatomy and physiology that there are sutures and fontanelles that make up the top of the head, right? What happens? Why are those important? Okay, so they can squeeze through. So what do they end up doing? Using they they mold. Remember that term mold, M O L D. And it's not like mold that grows on something, right? Mold is like taking Play-Doh and you're molding a shape. So the head molds so that it can fit through that passageway. So what is it doing? Those sutures and fontanelles are overlapping. They're overlapping. Now, can that happen to us right now? No. Luckily, right? Cannot happen to us now, but at this time, they can still overlap and mold their way to get through that passageway. So, there are four suture lines, and the picture shows the different suture lines and the different font nails. Okay. All right. There are two font nail spaces, though, that I really want you to pay attention to. This is what it's the real, the most important thing that I want you to know is that there is an anterior fontanelle that is diamond shaped, right? Anterior fontanelle, which is diamond shaped. When does that close? Remember? 12 to 18 months, between 12 and 18 months, right? When you are doing a baby assessment at the hospital, I hope that one of the things that you're doing is taking your fingers and just gently feeling the top of that head. If you haven't done that yet, I want you to do that. Feel for that fontanelle. It is very important. What does that fontanelle tell us if it is bulging? That the pressure is too high, right? That the pressure is too high. What if it's sunken? It's dehydrated. So there's two things that we that are very, very important about this spot nail. Now, we only have that advantage to tell what's going on with that child for 12 to 18 months. But in that time period, we at least know. So if that baby is exposed to meningitis, for example, that, that spot nail would be bulging because that causes increased intracranial pressure. So 12 to 18 months, it is diamond-shaped in appearance. The other one is the posterior font nail. That's the other one that I want you to pay attention to. The posterior font nail is triangle shaped, right? When does it close? Between six and eight weeks. It changes, it closes very quickly. And the reason for that is because how do we lay our babies? On their back, right? The newborn is back to sleep, right? It puts a lot of pressure on that font nail. So we're glad that it closes. Okay, but a newborn baby, if you do your newborn assessment, you can actually feel that diamond, I mean that triangle shape of the font nail. Six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks. Okay. All right, so those are the two that I really want you to know, the anterior and posterior font nails. Okay. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about with the passenger, this is still going along with the passenger, is the attitude, the attitude 
of the baby, okay? Normally, in utero, the baby is in what we call general flexion, okay? Ever heard of the fetal position, right? General flexion, all right? So, general flexion, and when you're in general flexion, the back is rounded, okay? So, the back is rounded. The chin is flexed to the chest. And then the knees are flexed to the abdomen. It's hard for anyone to get in that position. Okay. So the back is rounded, the chin touches the chest, and the knees touch the abdomen. So that's the fetal position. The little fetal position. The arms are typically crossed over the thorax. And on most ultrasounds, you'll see that the umbilical cord lies usually somewhere between the legs and the arms and it's floating all around. We talked about the umbilical cord, right? So general flexion. General flexion is the attitude. That's the most common attitude of the baby. And attitude, again, is the relationship of the fetal part to each other. The arms are crossed over the thorax. The little man here, whatever he is, he's standing next to me. Whatever. Flex. Okay, I got it? General flexion. We're going to look at some other attitudes in just a minute. Fetal lie is the next thing that you need to know about with the baby. The fetal lie is how it is resting, how the baby is resting in the abdomen, okay, the fetal lie. It is the relationship of the long axis of the baby, which is his spine, long axis of the baby, which is his spine, to the long axis of the mama, okay? Now, we want the fetal lie to be what? What do you think? Or longitudinal. We want it to be longitudinal, parallel longitudinal, right? So we want both long axes to be the same direction, correct? Whether that's breech, bottom down, or cephalic, head down. They're both longitudinal. We get into trouble when a baby is this way. This is a transverse lie. So what does that tell? And you can think about that because it's a T, right? The long axis of the mother, the long axis of the baby. So those are T's. You cannot vaginally deliver a baby that is in a transverse lie. Okay? So you want this baby to be either, well, pre preferably head down or butt down. But we want the longitudinal axis to be the same. Okay? The next thing about the passenger <clears throat> is how is he presenting? And I just mentioned that. Is he cephalic, which is head down? Is he breech, which is butt down? Or is he a shoulder? Shoulder is that transverse lie. So his shoulder. And what, is, what this is saying is the presentation is how is he presenting to me? Is he head down? So whatever is entering the pelvic inlet first. So in cephalic, the head is entering the pelvis first, right? Breach, the buttocks is hitting, is presenting first. Do I see that? So remember, those are longitudinal lies because they are the same, spine to spine. A shoulder presentation or a transverse lie looks like this. Okay, and that's of course not good, right? For one thing, his neck looks like it's going to snap. So when you're doing your check, when you're doing your vaginal exam, you're going to feel that bony shoulder and you're like, oh, it's not going to happen. Time for C section. Okay. Now, 
what I did up here is I've got a couple of different presentations. It's kind of hard to see, kind of fuzzy, but there's Frank Breach, what we call a Frank Breach, where he's got his, the difference in this, he's not a complete breach because his legs are straight up instead of flexed onto the abdomen. Remember we talked about we want them in general flexion, we want the knees flexed to the abdomen. His are just sticking straight up in the air. Okay, but he's still breached. But they, there's a single footling breach where you spread the woman's legs to do your exam and you've noticed his foot thing on out. <laughs> That's not a good sign either. You can have a single or a double footling breach. You count, but well, you can deliver those, but what do you think it's going to put problems on? In their head. Not their head. Yeah. Hips. Their hips. If you're trying to pull on that leg, trying to get them out, it's going to really do a number on the hips. So, footling breaches. Complete breach is in general flexion. So, you see his little knees are flexed, everything's flexed in the right position. He's just presenting with his butt down first. Okay, so he's complete breach. And then here's that picture of that shoulder. Okay, so, not so good. <coughs> Ninety-six percent, ninety-six percent of babies are born cephalic. Thank heavens, right? That's what we want. Ninety-six percent are born with the head down, and then the other one, uh, about three percent, is breech and shoulder is one percent. So can can you deliver back from the breech? You can. Right? You can. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. You can. It's not preferred. Okay. Because you have all that trauma. Yeah. Now, let's talk a, a little bit more about cephalic. And I want to go back a picture to this picture. When you're talking about a cephalic birth, it can be further divided by which part of the head is coming down first. Okay? And it's divided by the um, suture lines. So you see sensiput, the sensiput is the forehead. See that? The, sensi the sensiput, so it would be a cephalic breach with the sensiput presentation. That's the forehead, okay? Vertex is the back of the head, and that's what we want. We want it vertex, the back of the head. Ossiput is the base of the skull around the neck area, base of the skull. Okay. And then you can have face delivery, where the face is what's coming out first. The whole face. What do you think happens here? Well, their neck for one thing, but what about this poor little face? Oh, it looks like they, it is awful. It is all fault. You never want to see a face delivery because it's not only bruised, but it can be cut and lacerated. They may have what it almost looks like they have a stroke because they have had, they've got such trauma to the nerves in their face. It is a very pitiful, pitiful, pitiful looking little thing when they come out. So you definitely don't want them to deliver face down at all because it's so pitiful. So, again, remember that it can be further divided by the place of the head that's coming down. So, sensiput, vertex, ossiput, or face. So you'll see some references, and it may be in your book, I can't remember, but they call it a mentum, which is chin. Okay. Not good. Any questions so far? Good so far? So vertex is the... Vertex is the preferred. Vertex is preferred. So it's the back of the head, the top of the head. Okay? All right. We also need to know where the baby is in the pelvis. So we want to know how far that baby has made it down in the pelvis. We call that engagement. Engagement. Okay. 
okay, and gave me, now there's a picture, Katie's got it right here, hold that up, fetal station, yep, okay, that I put on there, y'all, did y'all see this little picture, he's so, so happy coming out, right, that tells us the station that the baby is coming down, so engagement means that the largest diameter of the presenting part, which we hope is the head, has made it into the pelvis and has settled into the true pelvis. I always say, remember engagement, you're locked in. It's kind of like getting engaged to somebody, which I know you're not really technically locked in, I guess you could say later, give them back the ring and say no, but okay. So you're locked in. So once they become engaged, that means the, so the largest diameter of the presenting part has gotten down into the true pelvis. Okay? Remember, the true pelvis is the bony prominences. Once it's down in here, it, you're set. It's locked in. You're locked in. So you want the head to be the part that's presenting. If you are a breech delivery, okay, and that butt has gotten locked in place, you're stuck, okay? <coughs> Either they're gonna try to deliver it breech, which is not recommended anymore, or they're gonna have to do a C-section, of course, and they're gonna have to pull him out of the pelvis, and that can also cause some trauma to the baby because he's stuck, it's like a suction cup. He's down in here now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so he's engaged. Now, station tells me where, how far he's sunk down. How far he's sunk down. Do you remember when you were talking about with Miss Chandler about checking fundal height postpartum for your postpartum assessment, right? Where was zero station? Do you remember? The belly button. Now, I don't want you to confuse that because we're going to talk now about zero station with the baby being delivered, okay? Zero station for delivery is the ischial spine. And I'm going to pass the pelvis around. The ischial spines are these little things that are sticking out right here. You see that? Okay. In, bless you, when the top of the presenting part is even with the ischial spines, that baby is said to be at zero station. Okay? Everybody hear me? I'm gonna say it one more time. When the when the presenting part, when the top of the presenting part is even with the ischial spines of the pelvis, that baby is said to be at zero station. Okay? Anything above those ischial spines is considered to be a negative number. So the first thing would be negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, on up. So the negatives go up, the positives go down. And what you can remember is that it's positive to be born. Okay, it's positive to be born. Does everybody understand? So zero station is at the ischial spine. Anything above the ischial spines is a negative number. And you can see that on that picture that I had Katie hold up. Anything that's above the ischial spines is a negative number. Anything that's below the ischial spines is a positive number. And what the little mnemonics is, is that plus four is on the floor. So you can think if zero is the ischial spines, then you've got plus one, plus two, plus three, and plus four, they're out. Okay. Now I'm going to pass this around so you can see where the ischial spines are located. Okay. Plus four is on the floor. So you can feel them. And when we do this, we're going to do our labor delivery check. Probably not today, but a couple of days from now. You'll be able to feel it. Okay. So does everybody understand that? Plus four is on the floor. Now, do you think that that can be subjective? Yes. Yes, it can be subjective, depending on the size of your hands, right? Some of these doctors, you've got male doctors who have really big hands or male nurses who have really big hands. They may think of it differently than you. 
But if you think about it, is that the, those initial spines are zero, and then you've only got three numbers, technically, before that baby is totally out, so you just divide your number okay, into plus one, two, three. All right, let's talk about one more thing before we take a break. Because this is the last thing about the passenger. All right, so we've talked about his attitude. We've talked about his life. We've talked about his position. All right? We've talked about the station. And now we're going to talk about the position inside the pelvis. Now, I do not expect you to be able to do this. This is way out of your league. But I do want you to know that there, are, there is a three-letter uh, step for identifying where the baby is lying inside the pelvis. Okay? There is a picture in your PowerPoints and in your book that shows all these different positions. I do not expect you to know that. I'm not going to give you a picture on the test and say identify is this a right or left, occiput or occiput or whatever, because it is very hard to tell and it takes a lot of practice. But what I do want you to know is what those three letters stand for. So it's the position, the relationship of the presenting part to the pelvis of the mother. The first letter is either R or L for right or left. So what that's telling me is, and let's say that this is a cephalic verb, and he is vertex, so the vertex is the presenting part, okay? Which is what we want, right? So the vertex is either facing right or left of the mother's pelvis. Either right or left of the mother's pelvis. And the problem is, the hard part about that is, is that sometimes it's very difficult. And if you look at that picture, it's very difficult to tell what, which side that, that head is facing. Okay? But R or L means right or left, which means that the presenting part is either facing the right side of the mother's pelvis or the left side of the mother's pelvis. Okay? The middle letter can either be O, S, M or SC. And that's just telling me what part is coming down. If it's the occiput, that means it's the head. Okay? The occiput is the head. If it's S, that means it's the sacrum. So what type of birth is that? Breach. Breach. That's the butt. So that means it's the butt first. Okay? If it's an M, what did I say a minute ago? What is M? Chin. His chin, so it's a face delivery. The chin's coming out. And if it's SC, what would that be? A transverse birth, so because you can feel the scapula. Okay? So that's the middle letter. So you've either got right or left, occiput, sacrum, mentum, or scapula. And then the, the third letter is, is it, not only is it facing right or left, but is it facing the front or the back of the mother, okay? So again, if you look at that picture, you've got to tell whether or not the top of the head, is it backwards or forwards? Now, it's a little easier with that just because you can tell whether or not the face is facing more out than back, okay? But is it anterior or posterior to the mother? Okay, so that's your only choice is anterior, posterior, transverse. Okay, now what I want you to know though is that ROA is the ideal position for the baby to be delivered in. ROA is the ideal position for the baby to be delivered in. So what does that tell me? It is, what is R? Right, right, opposite, anterior, okay, right, opposite, anterior. L-O-A is okay as well. R-O-A is most common. L-O-A is okay as well. But those are the best positions for the baby to be in for delivery. So if I gave you those three letters, or some three letters, on your test, could you tell me what each of those letters mean? Right or left is that? So you're looking at it. Okay. 
Why would the right be more or better than left? It's just the way the babies come down in the proper way. Yeah. Now look at that picture. I've got it on your PowerPoint. It's hard to see, of course, on your PowerPoint. That's why I wanted you to look in the book. But you can see it's very difficult to tell. It takes a lot of practice. So that's why I don't expect you to know how to do this. I just expect you to know what those, that you can determine what those three letters mean. So if I said it was L-O-T, what would that be? Left, opposite, transverse. Okay, could we deliver that? You cannot deliver a transverse lie, remember? You cannot deliver because it's a T. You cannot deliver transverse, right? Okay. All right. So we good so far? So far, so good. All right. Let's take a break. Take a potty break. Those are involuntary contractions. They're going to start whether or not you want them to start or not. All right? Those are called primary forces, involuntary contractions. The second thing is secondary forces. And those are voluntary. That is something that you yourself have to do. And those are called the bearing down. That's the bearing down or pushing by the woman. So both of those things have to work in sync in order for this baby to be born. Contractions have to start and the woman has to be able to bear down. All right? Now... Somebody said when we were making our list up there that somebody said a term that was very important. They said 10 centimeters. And you, you should never start pushing until you get to 10 centimeters. And that is one of my biggest pet peeves in the labor room is that doctors and some of the nurses get very impatient. And they want that woman to start pushing before she gets completely dilated. The thought is that as this baby is bearing down on that cervix, it will force it open and it will force it to thin more. But what they forget is that if you start pushing against a cervix that is not ready, it can cause trauma. It can cause swelling and lacerations to that cervix. And it will not be ready. Body, it's, it's a tough little organ and it has to do its own little thing. 
Um, now, what you may see them doing is they'll go up with their fingers and they'll do this number. Have you seen that? They're, still, they're like stretching. But what they're doing is they're stretching the outlet. They're stretching the outlet. So the body has to do its own dilation and effacement. But it is a very poor practice to have someone push against the cervix that is not completely dilated and not completely effaced because you're doing a disservice for your patient. You're going to cause them to have trauma and potentially trauma to this baby. You know, if, the, if they push against that cervix, then it swells shut, that opening swells shut, they're going to have labored for God knows how many hours in pain, and then all of a sudden, have you ever seen these people who, they'll say, they've, they've, been in, uh, they've labored for 10 hours, and then they say, oh, uh, you're going to have to have a C-section. Yeah? Okay. And, you know, you feel so sorry for those people. And they'll say, oh, well, the baby just won't come out. And you know why it won't come out? And this is what they don't tell you. You know why it won't come out? Because they had you pushing and pushing and pushing for 10 hours against the cervix that wasn't ready. So they've done that. They are the ones who are typically, 95% of the time, the ones responsible for that woman having that situation because they were not ready. Their body wasn't ready. go into labor and delivery, this is one of this is something I want you to, to internalize. Do not do that. Okay, because I feel sorry for those women. Does anybody know anybody like that? Anybody ever anybody ever know anybody that pushed and pushed and pushed and then all of a sudden they have to have a C section after laboring for that long? It happened to me, they didn't have me push long, but they did have me start pushing and then Yeah. And everything just well, shut. So it's twenty hours. Yeah. Twenty hours. Mm -hmm. Twenty hours. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? All right. Now, contractions. Those contractions are primary forces. Remember I said that? Oh, birth. We have another little thing about inducing labor. Let's see what it says. Oh, we missed things to take the hospital. We'll have to look back at that one in a minute. Let's look at inducing labor. So, oh, this is a wonderful thing. This is about castor oil. We don't do this anymore. Perhaps the first attempt will be made with the well-known expedient of castor oil, with or without a small dose of quinine. Does anybody know what quinine is given for? Malaria. They used to give quinine with castor oil in order to get you induced to start to start contracting. Followed by a hot soap suds enema. Doesn't that sound fun? So you're taking castor oil, quinine, and a hot soap suds enema, hopefully to get your primary forces started. The easiest way to take castor oil is as follows. After coating the inner surfaces and edges of a drinking glass with orange juice, then the castor oil, and finally a few more tablespoonfuls of orange juice on top. Now comes the most important part. Place in your mouth. Listen, this is just crazy to me. Place in your mouth, well back against the palate, a piece of ice about the size of a walnut and hold it there until it becomes quite painful. <laughs> this temporarily paralyzes the taste buds on your tongue. And if the sandwich of castor oil and orange juice is taken as soon as the ice is removed, there is little or no sense of taste. This is how you induce labor. Oh. Yeah. Doesn't that sound appetizing? So, of course, we don't do that anymore. Um, we don't, it, we don't induce like a little castor oil and orange juice and quinine and all that fun stuff. We want these primary forces to start on their own. That's our, that's our goal, right? Some people do still do it, and it is dangerous, and you've got to be very careful about that. All right, so let's talk about these contractions. Okay, there are three things that we're going to learn about contractions. Duration of the contraction, the intensity of the contraction, and the frequency of the contraction, so the dia, what we call the dia. Okay? The 
Contraction is like a pacemaker. It sends out a signal and it has to work its way down to do its thing. So it has to start at the top of the uterus and then work its way down. Now we're going to talk about, in a couple of days, we're going to talk about dystocia, which is abnormal labor. And we're going to learn that part of our problem occurs with this pacemaker point. Okay, So we want it to start at the top of the uterus and work its way down. So it's the contraction starts and it's like a wave all the way down. And as it occurs, as that contraction occurs, it causes this, this cervix that we have right here to start to thin and start to stretch, okay? The bet, one of the best things I can think to tell you is like when you play with Play-Doh and you have a lot of Play-Doh in front of you and you take your fist and you kind of push down on that Play-Doh, what's it gonna do? It's gonna thin out in the middle and it's gonna push it up on the sides, right? Everybody ever done that before or dough? Okay, it's the same principle. So you've got this head and these contractions are working together and it's pushing down on the dough, on the play dough, okay? And it's causing it to thin out or a face and it's causing it to dilate and stretch. It's one of the best ways I can think of to figure out how it works. Okay, now I want you to look at this picture on the next slide. This is the this is a picture of a contraction. So the duration of the contraction is from the beginning of the contraction to the end of the same contraction. Okay, so if I ask you what is the duration of a contraction, it's from the beginning of the contraction to the end of the same contraction. Okay. The frequency of contractions is you measure it from the beginning of the contraction to the beginning of the next contraction. So what the frequency is, is how long, how far apart are they? How, how often are these contractions coming? Are they occurring? The frequency, so the frequency of the contractions is from the beginning of a contraction to the beginning of the next contraction. So there's a difference between duration and frequency. Okay. Intensity, which when you're looking at DIF, D -I -F, intensity is how strong is that contraction at its peak, or like on this picture they call it acne, the peak. So how strong is that contraction? Everybody understand what is the diff contraction that how do you measure the diff the diff the duration? Tell me. <clears throat> Same contraction. Okay. The I is intensity. What is that? Strength. That is strength. Okay. And then what's frequency? Beginning to beginning. Beginning of the next contraction. Right. Exactly. Okay. So everybody can do that. Now the next couple of slides on your on your PowerPoint is just about dilation and and effacement. We've already talked about that, right? So we have to be zero to ten centimeters, and we have to be zero to hundred percent effaced. Labor should occur, or you should start pushing when the cervix can no longer be felt. And I've got a magic box up here that we're going to play with probably tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Where you can all feel for cervix. Okay, where I want you all feel the different types of cervix. Okay, so zero to ten and zero to one hundred. And then secondary forces. We talked about that. When a woman is bearing down, it's that expulsive urge. She has to use her abdominal muscles and her diaphragm in order to push that baby out. So secondary forces are power pushing that baby out. Okay, let's let's go ahead just for the fun of it and let's let's feel for let's do our cervical check. 
Okay, so I'm gonna set this up. This is my magic box. And every box, I'm gonna put a little path in the ring. Well, no, we'll let everybody come up here. I'm gonna get it set up and then I'll let everybody come up here and take a proper feel. This is our vagina. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to take two fingers, and we're going to, I'll have you guys, have you ever seen these nice little things? They have them a lot in the, in the rooms, okay? What these are is to try to tell you what you're feeling for, okay? So this is one centimeter. It is not thin. It's still thick, okay? So I know, and it's, again, it's just, you have to know your own hand. I know that, that with 10 centimeters, I can take my fingers and stretch them all the way from one side to the other and it feels like my fingers are breaking. If you have a small hand, you may know to, in your mind, well, I know that at 10 centimeters, I can't stretch my fingers. I can't feel either side. So they must be 10 centimeters because I can't feel either side. Does that make sense? I can feel one and I can't reach across to the other. So I'll pack these around. Y'all can kind of feel these. And then while y'all are feeling these, just kind of distribute them around. Okay, while y'all are feeling these, I will let you come up. Does that make this perfect? Okay. Now what you're gonna feel, what you're gonna feel is this is about two centimeters dilated. This one's about two centimeters dilated, and it's about 75% in phase on the right. Don't you feel the difference? What is it? Is it big or small? Thanks. 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 Thanks.